Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. So we are on to understanding our classical model of output and employment. Let's just go through these last slides quickly and then we are done with our chapter 1 of Freud. Okay? So in this slide I have written that real wage is equal to marginal product of labor. What does it mean? We already know what it means. Okay, So I am not going to repeat myself here. In other words, we can say, because this is this is one thing and then it's just the same thing that money wage has to be equal to marginal product of labor multiplied by price. So this price is coming here and it's a multiplicative. So what does it mean? That we can also say that money wage has to be equal to marginal revenue product of labor. Okay, and we're going to use this thing in our next figure. That's why I just put it into slides. All right. Now we are on to this picture, this diagram and this is very very important and if you observe this figure carefully, you are going to have clear understanding of what I am going to explain right now. We don't need any textual explanation here. This figure is sufficient. This picture is sufficient. Okay. Let's just observe the figure that is at lower side. We have employment onto the x-axis and we have money wage onto the y-axis. So observe the difference here. Earlier we talked about real wage onto the y-axis but now we have money wage onto the y-axis. Okay, Employment as usual and money wage here. Okay, Now we have something called marginal revenue product of labor that is MPN multiplied by P1. Okay, So wage rate is W1, marginal revenue product of labor is here. And if suppose the supply curve of labor, which is always upward sloping or positively sloped, is MS1, their intersection is at point here, and we have equilibrium level of employment as 0 and 1, and equilibrium wage rate as 0 W1. Now, one pertinent question is how come labor supply curve is this, and why we are writing P1 here? Okay. So we know that labor supply is a positive function of real wage. Here we are deliberately trying to show labor supply and demand as function of money wage. So this is the difference that we are trying to encapture here. So in this particular case we are trying to show that if prices are P1 and money wage is W1 then this will be our labor supply curve and this will be our labor demand curve and their intersection gonna determine the equilibrium level of employment which in this case turns out to be 0 and 1 okay p1 price just to make a, make it easier for us to recognize the kind of different supply curves we're gonna be drawing okay now let's suppose that prices in the economy has gone up from p1 to p2 okay now when prices go up, we know that marginal revenue product of labor gonna go up. It's gonna shift rightwards or upwards. Okay. I am sure you people know why we are shifting it rightwards. It's quite simple. It's just that I have come across people who otherwise got confused in this tiny thing. So, but either way, I'm not gonna explain this because it's really, really simple. Huh? If you people already know, it's gonna, it's like making a fool of myself explaining this thing. Okay. So yeah. Moment prices have gone up, marginal pro revenue product of labor has gone up. So we are shifting this curve towards the right or towards the upward side. Okay, we, have, we got this curve here, MPN into 2P1. Okay, what does it mean? It means that if we are keeping the money wage same, that is D zero W1, then entrepreneurs will be willing to hire N2 level of people. Employment can go up from 0 and 1 to 0 and 2. Okay. Now, we know that classical assumes that labor are quite intelligent. They have perfect information. Wages are quite flexible. Okay. So, people are going to immediately come to realization that no, no, no. Their income has actually fallen. Their real income has gone down because prices have gone up. So, labor will be like if you are willing to offer 0 w1 wage rate when prices has gone up from p1 to p2 
then we will be willing to offer only 0 and 2 level of employment that is up till here they're gonna reduce their supply of labor from 0 and 1 to 0 and 2 so you got this point here now observe this thing in the in the new scenario we got labor demand which is here 0 and 2 and we got labor supply which is here that is 0 and and 2 hash so labor demand exceeds labor supply so what's gonna happen money wage gonna go up so you're gonna have an new equilibrium at this particular point and we are seeing that we are back to original level of employment so let's just pause a bit and understand this thing in a greater detail what actually has happened is entrepreneurs are willing to hire these many workers if this is the money wage that is 0 w1 is the money wage okay so as money wage keep on increasing they are gonna decrease their willingness to offer employment to workers so we are gonna have a movement from this particular point towards this leftward movements along the marginal revenue product curve okay and as wages keep on increasing from w1 to 2w1 we're gonna see laborers willing to offer more of their work more of, more of their supply they're gonna increase their supply so we're gonna be seeing a rightwards movement onto the supply curve of labor that is from here to here so new equilibrium is established here when both labor demand and labor supply has been accommodated okay and we are back to the original level of employment that's it i think i really explained it in the detail and this much was actually not needed okay so in the same way when prices go up from p1 to 3p1 so it has originally gone up from p1 to 2p1 and when it goes further towards 3p1 we'll have that same scenario happening here marginal revenue product shifting rightwards or upwards supply of labor curve shifting leftwards and we're gonna have another equilibrium established at this particular point when wage rate has gone up from 2w1 to 3w1 what we are observing here is that we are back to original level of employment every time any change is happening in the prices because wages are also changing in the same proportion okay so there is an equal proportion change in the wages and prices in the money wages and prices to be more precise so that real wage remains constant okay so prices goes up money wage goes up and we are seeing that real wage is constant in this sense 3w1 upon 3p1 is equal to 2w1 upon 2p1 is equal to w1 upon p1 okay so the perfect flexibility of money wage and prices are keeping the equilibrium level of employment at its original level that is 0 and 1 and this is what has been explained in this particular diagram towards the upper side it is quite simple it's just that we have labor supply curve here we have labor demand here and this is this gonna be our equilibrium level of employment doesn't matter what the price level is be it p1 2p1 3p1 and why so because money wages are flexible so the ratio gonna be constant all the time okay so flexibility of money wages is the reason why we always have equilibrium at full level of employment okay this is what i have written here that equal proportional change in both price level and money wages leave the quantity of labor supply unchanged and that is it okay and this is we have aggregate supply curve here this is quite important i mean this is the crux of whatever we have studied up till now that yes aggregate supply curve in case of classical is always vertical it is always inelastic okay there is no slope slope it's just inelastic it has to be always at o w1 o y1 that's it there is no other way around even if prices are p1 2p1 3p1 doesn't matter output will always be the same and we know why because employment will always be at the same level o and 1 and if employment is always at o and 1 then combining that employment with the production function we always have the same level of output okay so remember memorize this conclusion that classical aggregate supply curve is always vertical always upward inelastic okay
now we have something called supply determined nature of classical aggregate output this thing is very very important there can be a an individual and separate question on this particular topic so let me just read this thing for you so as to make it comprehensive it is the supply it is the labor supply which is a function of real wages that plays an important role in the determination of the labor market equilibrium and employment and employment determines the level of output thus in the classical model employment and output are determined solely by the factors operating on the supply side of the labor market so what does it mean it means that nowhere we have talked about aggregate demand at all we know that in the real world we have something called aggregate supply then aggregate demand and then their intersection determines the equilibrium level of output okay but in this particular case we know that it's just the aggregate supply and that's it whatever we are producing that is our output and that is automatically an equilibrium level of output we are not letting aggregate demand come into picture whatever being produced it's already our equilibrium level it means it's gonna be sold automatically in the market we don't really need to consider aggregate demand here which is quite irrational thing but we're not deviating from what we are studying we're gonna get into criticism classical then we'll discuss that yes it indeed indeed is not the case but right now we're talking about why is the aggregate supply curve supply determined number one aggregate demand doesn't come into picture whatever is being produced it's automatically being solved so this is this is our output equilibrium level of output okay and in the whatever is being produced it depends upon the supply side factors and what are those factors it depends upon production function it depends upon the amount of capital we are adding amount of labor we are adding and how come how come we i'm so sorry and how come we come at the labor market equilibrium we come at the labor market equilibrium through the supply of labor here we know that equilibrium in the labor market was determined by intersection of labor demand curve and labor supply curve but classical economists assume that it is majorly the supply of labor which gonna determine the equilibrium level of employment okay so equilibrium level of employment is determined by supply of labor and further the output is determined by that equilibrium level of employment adding we're gonna add capital here and technology here and all these factors are something onto the supply side of market okay we haven't yet talked about the demand side factor here so long story short we haven't talked about demand side here and whatever we have talked about all are the supply side variable be it labor supply curve be it capital be it technology be it anything okay so yeah that's it supply determined nature of classical aggregate output is this is because of these very reasons okay so now we are on to the collapse of classical economics you can read this slide on your own there's nothing much into this okay now last thing criticism of classical theory of employment is just a matter of five minutes friends but the point is we're gonna be comparing ourselves with the keynesian economics each and every time because keynesian economics came as a critique to the classicals now so I will be हमेशा मैं यही बोलती रहूँगी कि अभी हमको ये पढ़ना है ये पढ़ना है जब भी किसी भी क्रिटिसिज्म के बारे में अगर हम बात करेंगे तो बेटर है कि हम वो चीज़ पढ़ ही लें राइट अदरवाइज इट्स गना भी रियली रियली फ्रस्ट्रेटिंग एंड रिडंडेंट ऑन माय पार्ट्स एज टू की पॉन सेंग नीड टू स्टडी दिस थिंग सो या लॉन्ग स्टोरी शॉर्ट विगना भी स्टडी कीन्स एंड इकनॉमिक्स फर्स्ट सो एज टू अंडरस्टैंड द क्रिटिसिज्म ऑफ क्लासिकल थ्योरी ओके येस सो यू लेफ्ट विथ टू थिंग्स हेयर नंबर वन क्रिटिसिज्म एंड नंबर टू there are tiny things that achal ahuja has explained for example what's going to happen if we shift the production function and we know the shift in production function can happen either because of change in let's say technology or innovation okay so it's going to take 2 3 minutes to explain those thing but we are studying from fryan and fryan has not explained those thing yet so let's just not deviate from the book we are following so that's it we are following fryan and we're done with chapter 1 from next slides onward we're going to be studying chapter 2 and whatever we have not studied that i think are important and otherwise have come into the exam we're going to be discussing that after we are done with the fine okay so yes thank you so much for watching these videos friends and again if you think that these videos are helping you in any way then please share them with your friends okay thank you so much once again goodbye